Today we are supposed to start with 2.2 separating and purifying substances. Uh, separation and purification are two separate words. In separation, we'll all just separate the substances. And in purification, we'll be interested in the purity of the product. The more pure it is, the better. However, we are going to discuss both kinds of processes, ones those can simply separate and ones which can give us a high priority product. In all of the processes that I'm, out, I'm about to discuss with you, I'll keep on talking about whether they can go for an easy separation or they can give us a good purity at the end of the process. Before we get started, the most useful separation method for a particular mixture depends upon two factors. And first one is type of the mixture. The second one is which substance in the mixture we're most interested in. In order to understand this part better, I think before we even get started with any of the mixtures, let's go with this table. Table 2.3 on the next page gives us a very good idea about how many kinds of mixtures are there. Not all the kinds have been discussed over here, but yeah, the most common ones are. And the method of separation. This would discuss the previous two points that we have just discussed, uh, basis of on which we are going to select our method. Let's start from the top. Solid and solid powder mixtures, we can use some difference in properties if there is a difference in density or solubility or sublimation or magnetism, we'd be able to uh, separate two solids. Remember, we're talking about powdered mixtures. If we're not talking about powdered mixture, let's say uh, the past papers have discussed the cases or scenarios in which we are actually separating pieces of one solid from another, yeah, there are some methods that you can come up with on the basis of common sense. What are those? We'll discuss in, in them in the, the factors given below. We're going to discuss the density, solubility, sublimation, magnetism in detail. So I'll discuss uh, those scenarios over there. Moving on, suspension of any solid in a liquid, we're going to use filtration. Not just for suspension, if there is some insoluble solid, let's say, we may also be able to use filtration or centrifugation for those processes. In fact, if you have worked in a lab before, then you would know that filtration is mostly used for insoluble solids rather than just suspensions. Moving on, liquid plus liquid mixtures are of two types, miscible or immiscible. Once those dissolves are miscible, which we are gonna discuss later, and immiscible are the ones we are going to discuss over here. We are either going to use a separating funnel, which is actually a piece of apparatus, or we are going to use the decantation method. We're going to discuss each and every method given over here in detail. We're about to face 10 different methods over here in this table. Moving on, solution of solid in liquid. Now, this one is, is going to give you a very good idea how the process depends upon the product we are interested in. Let's say we have a solution of salt in water, then we'll definitely understand from the example that salt is our solute and water is our solvent, most probably. And whenever we are going to do that, we, if we're interested in salt, the solid, we're going to use the evaporation or the crystallization process. If we're interested in obtaining the liquid, which is the solvent, we might use the distillation process. Now, distillation is a process which will be further categorized into different categories uh, in, on upcoming pages. Uh, there are different types. A few of them are discussed in your syllabus. So um, I would rather suggest my students not to use the word distillation alone. Always name the specific type. Why is the book using this word? Let me tell you, it's the first time they are going to discuss something like this. So have, they have used the word distillation as a general broader category, which ha can have many types. However, you are going to bifurcate that into simple distillation and fractional distillation. There are other types such as destructive distillation, uh, distillation in the absence of air and other kinds of distillations, but we're going to just discuss these two in IGCSE slavers. When we have two or more liquids mixed together in a miscible solution, let's say we have mixed uh, water with alcohol and with hexanol, then 
we can separate them with the help of fractional distillation. This is also a type of distillation. Lastly, if we have solution of two or more solids in a single liquid, we can separate them by chromatography. Again, chromatography has many types. The type that we are going to cover in IGCSE status is going to be paper chromatography. So although the words simple distillation and chromatography has been used over here, but I suggest my students, whenever they are writing these words as an answer to their question in specifically paper four, use the terms simple or fractional distillation, not just distillation, because that might confuse your point, and paper chromatography instead of the word just chromatography, all right? Now, if you are going to look it up in the next version of the book, this is the fourth edition of the same book. The same authors have used the same set of ideas in the fifth edition of the book. Although I have been teaching these ideas before the, even book, the book was published, because this was published back in March 2020, but I've been teaching the same ideas even before. And you'll see that the past papers, and by that I mean exactly the marking schemes, are conveying the same message since 2018. So make sure you don't make those kind of mistakes in the exams, because now they are considered as mistakes. Previously, they were simply ignored and the marks were given to students. Now they do not credit the marks anymore. Let's start with the processes in the order of which they are given in the book. The very first process which is given in the book is decanting. Decanting is a pretty simple process and can be explained by a simple phrase, careful pouring. Let's say we have a liquid with some particles whose uh, particle, solid particles who are large enough to settle down at the bottom. Let's say we have a beaker full of water. We added a salt whose particles are so large enough that they are insoluble and settle down at the bottom. Let's consider it as pure sand. It would settle down at the bottom. If we simply pour off the water into an other piece of gratis carefully, so much so that we get the water and we leave the particles out, and with some particles, maybe a little amount of water as well, you call it decanting. Decanting is a separating technique. It's not a purifying technique. One, two, decanting is only considered as a rough technique as it does not give you the complete amount of the substance you're interested in. Take a look. This part of the liquid has been poured into another apparatus, but this one still may contain some liquid. So it's not a very good process. It does not give you higher yields and it cannot give you a pure product. Are we good? Yes, Mr. I'm, so, I'm so confused uh, about the decanting process. Can you repeat one more time, sir? Sure, sure. If you're uh, confused about the process, the process is pretty simple uh, that we carefully pour off. Um, let me give an example. Milk is a common liquid that consists of a few solids. Those solids can be separated from milk. If the milk is heated for some time, the solids will move to the top and will make a layer. We usually call that layer as cream. Now cream is usually skimmed off from the top of the milk easily by using a simple spoon, or you can even carefully pour it off. So the cream is at the top, the milk is at the bottom, Whichever layer you want, you can carefully pour it off into another apparatus, like this layer into this one, and leave the rest. As simple as that, this careful pouring is known as decanting. Let me give you an, another example. Pakistani foods, and uh, let me tell you, many of them usually contain a lot of gravy. Now, gravy base substances or foods usually consist of a liquid material apart from whatever vegetables or meat it's cooked in and then there is a small layer of oil on top because of which we have been crit criticized as a nation that we consume a lot of cooking oil now what we do is that we keep cooking in the same way but if we don't want to eat that cooking oil we usually take that cooking oil off of the top and simply you can do that 
with the help of a spoon or anything you like. I mean, careful pouring. Do you get the point? Yes, yes, I get the point. Sometimes people do that with the cream on top of coffee. If they don't like the cream, they simply uh, skim it off and take, they use the coffee regularly, normally. So that is the case. with tea, sir. I've seen people do it with tea, not with coffee. Tea, but mostly right? With tea. Often. But uh, in Pakistan, we don't serve tea with cream. <laughs> Coffees are do served with cream, but not tea. How a, a yeah with cold tea that might be possible. Okay, well, different areas have different cultures. You never know. Okay, yes, so yes. Uh, about that part where I called decanting a separation technique and not a purifying process because the product it gives you is not of complete heal one because you cannot take 100% of the substance off with just careful pouring. It requires a rather sophisticated techniques, right? So first, you're not going to get the complete yield or the complete product you're interested in. Maybe something more or less, maybe still an impurity would remain there even after careful pouring, right? So it's just a separating technique. It's not a purifying process. The purifying processes are the ones which can give you anything more than of 95% heal or purity. We'll call those processes as purifying processes. As I haven't taught you one yet, so I can give you an example. But later on, I'm going to include distillation as one of those purifying techniques, as well as crystallization being one of them. All right? Decantation is usually considered a little less in papers. So we're not gonna spend much time on it because this usually is not a part of past papers. This is pretty rare. Moving on, something which have been a part of past paper quite commonly is filtration. And filtration is something which students have done with their own hands in lab. So I think this is a process students can easily understand. As the diagram shows it very well, we know what a stand is used for. The filter paper is actually the filtration medium. It has small pores through which a few things can pass, but it can stop any larger sized particles. So what happens, any uh, water soluble material along with water goes through it, passes through it, but any water insoluble material usually stays on the top of filter paper. Filter paper is usually folded in a proper way and put in a filter funnel and what we get on top of filter paper is usually solid, known as residue, a generic term for that. Whatever passes through the filter paper, maybe water, maybe some other solvent, that liquid is commonly known as filtrate. Again, a generic term. Now, filtration is a very easy process. Even students can do it. It does not have a, a huge learning curve, does not take uh, uh, much of a learning but, but what it takes, maybe a lot of time. Filtration is considered uh, with its only disadvantage as a slow process. So we have an alternative to speed up the process. The alternative is to use a Buckner's funnel. A Buckner's funnel actually has a glass plate, which is usually perforated. By that, I mean it has holes. We cover it with a circle of filter paper, and it is usually used in an airtight environment. However, there is a link to a vacuum pump on a sidearm flask, which sucks the air out. Because of this uh, vacuum pump connection, it sucks the air, increases the pressure on top of this liquid, which pushes this liquid into this flask with speed. Hence, we speed up the entire process. So the only disadvantage of filtration can be replaced by using a Buckner's funnel. Are we good? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Moving on. Next up is centrifugation. Centrifugation is least used methods of uh, all of these. And actually, to be honest, centrifugation has been a part of uh, past ten years just once. Okay. Centrifugation is a process in which the mixture is spun at high speeds in a centrifuge, just like we do with uh, during washing of our clothes. The washing of clothes is usually done in laundromats and 
our washing machines, and they actually spin our clothes in a high speed. What happens is that the solid, whichever part of dirt or pieces are there, usually deposit at the bottom of the centrifuge tube or whichever hollow top structure we have in washing machines, and the liquid can be carefully decanted off. So centrifugation actually follows decantation as a process in order to properly separate. So centrifugation isn't considered a good technique, but it's used in the processes where it's considered to be good and cheap. I mean, inexpensive. So let's move on. Let's not waste time on centrifugation because if you understand they are spun at high speeds and the solid deposits at the bottom because of being heavy, that's about it. That's all you need to understand about centrifugation. Moving on, separating immiscible liquids. Remember, immiscible liquids were the ones that didn't dissolve into one another. Not just that, if we take immiscible liquids in one beaker or one container, they're going to form different layers. The one that goes to the bottom, remember that's the most dense layer. And the one that uh, goes to the top is the least dense. Remember, higher the density, the chances would be more it would go to the bottom. Lower the density, the chances would be more for it to stay up top. Now, we can use actually use a separating funnel and we can tap off the layers. Now, tapping off the layers is a little tricky. This is not explained in the book because they assume the students would understand it after doing this experiment in the lab. But most of the time when I talk to students, I've heard that they have never even performed a single experiment related to separating funnel. So let's explain one over here. Now we have two diagrams. This one is the actual diagram in which we have probably have a colorless liquid and a color liquid up top. This automatically gives you the idea that the color liquid has low density and the colorless one has the higher density. Now what we do, if we are going to separate this one, what we are supposed to do is to take a beaker Slowly open the tap, drop by drop, let the colorless liquid go out into the beaker. There would come a point when this middle layer will move all the way over here. Stop the tap before this layer even goes down. Change the beaker, get a new empty beaker, and push this layer drop by drop into that beaker. As soon as you see that there are no colorless liquids there, stop the tap again. Then take this volume out in another beaker. So actually what you did is that you took this much in first beaker, the central portion in a second beaker, and this much in the third beaker. Now what you're supposed to do is to take this solution again and go for a separation, second separation. Separating funnel actually may require a number of separations before we can get to a good purity. But this can be a separation technique, and if we're performed a number of times and with some careful methods, it may give you a purity uh, to 95% or maybe more. Do you get the point? Uh, yes, yes, Mr. Mr. I have a question, Mr. Say, say that again, please. Yeah, Mr. I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, so, Mr. If we uh, if we pour the the least dense uh, liquid first in the funnel, and then uh, we pour the uh, the dense liquid above it, is the le is the least dense liquid going to mix with the dense and go on top of it? Actually, you, if you do it that way, then you're supposed to give them settling time. Settling time is the time which is taken by the liquids to come up to their original positions at which they are supposed to. Let's suppose this is least dense. I'm going to show that with LD. In fact, my bad. Let's go with the most dense first and least dense at the bottom. Okay, what you did is that you poured off least dense first into your container. And after that, the most dense was the second one. Now, you're going to give them a setting time, which is usually in lab 15 to 25 minutes. If you let them settle for 15 to 25 minutes, you would notice and if they're colored ones, if this is going to be a very interesting process, you would notice this would go to towards the top there and this would come down. This you can perform at home. Most dense is going to be 
water at your home and B stents is going to be any cooking oil, hair oil, or oil of any sort, except machine oil, all right? And if you perform this experiment with oil putting up oil first and water after, you can even shake them if you want to, give them their sippling time, and they will come to, into such a position that most stints will come at the bottom layer and least stints will come to the top layer, so much so that you would easily be able to bifurcate the layers upon visual observation. So what we do is that before we even start this experiment, we always give them a settling time. No matter how many liquids are there, they're always going to arrange themselves in layers. However, however, if you're going to go with more than three liquids, the movement might be stopped with a bigger density difference. This is one of the interesting experiments present on a difference of density, and they usually work with three to four different layers. They usually add dyes to them to color them up to show you a very colorful science experiment, making science more interesting for students. They usually do it with olive oil, ethanoic acid, ethanol, water, and different other liquids. Well, that's a part of internet, but that's for fun, not for exact science. This much is good enough what you're going to encounter in ICCSC for a separation technique. Are we good? Yes, Mr. All right, let's move on. Up next is, we're gonna go back to the previous page, is separating mixtures of solids. Now, before we move ahead, let me remind you that the mixtures of solid, fibroid mixtures, had four differences we needed to consider. Density, solubility, sublimation and magnetism. So, considering density first. For density, usually the simplest of materials, the elements, have a difference in density. And because of this difference, we can always separate them easily. Separate, not purify. Now, panning is a common process for coal, which is still carried out in the search for new deposits. Amazonia river beds around Peru, Chile, and Brazil, mechanically sifted, vacuum cleaned uh, processes were carried out to, for the coal dust. Now, if we go back like a hundred years, even more, there were some very poor families who had their bread and butter earned in such a way that the whole family would rise up in the morning, take their pans, which had net or mesh at the bottom, go to the nearby Amazonian river and just simply uh, mechanically sift for coal. They went through riverbed, through the silt, the sand, the stones for to collect small pieces of coal. We usually call it coal dust. Now, this method actually depends upon coal dust being denser than most of the other substances in river sediment. The soil, the sand, the silt, the small pieces of stone, among all of these, usually gold particles were found to be the, the dense, most dense ones. And they were easily separated when they went through mechanical sifting processes. And mechanical sifting means so just simply move it up and down in a vibratory motion, and you will slowly be able to take out all of the sand and cell, and you would start seeing gold. As soon as you see a shiny gold, you can simply separate it with, the hand, with hand picking, the easiest of methods in those times. In the same way, copper is also very dense and can be separated as well. All right? So panning or mechanical sifting has been uh, the simplest of process for humans to separate out substances with high density. We even do that with some specific kinds of seeds. This is done for wheat in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, very commonly. Moving on, let me tell you the difference in density has been considered in exams read, just like centrifugation. Magnetic properties. This has been considered in exams a um, little more than the previous ones, but still less. Why? Because we consider the separation as the easiest of everything. Why? Because students usually know from their previous classes, fourth, fifth, sixth, that magnets can attract specific metals. When we talk about it, let me name them. 
magnet can attract iron it can attract nickel so these elements can be attracted by the magnet and we can simply separate them in order to separate some bigger materials the example given over here usually belongs to recycling of materials iron objects can be picked out of scrap metal using electromagnets and i hope you understand electromagnets from physics do you yes sir electromagnets uh, when the metal is uh, covered with wires and it converts right. into uh, it's behaving as a magnet right so you take bigger iron pieces cover them with copper wires they run a high voltage of current through them there you go the iron piece has been converted into a magnet we actually call it an electromagnet electromagnetics are commonly used in junkyards to pick up junk cars and to recycle their metals or non-metals for that purpose. Moving on, next up is difference in solubility. This process is written in this book with uh, not big of a detail, but has been considered in past papers with a lot more detail. So I'm going to add a few things and you might want to get your pencil ready. It's better to write it on the book. This difference in solubility has a common name by the process of crystallization. All right. So for crystallization, we actually have four steps. The first step is formation of solution. In first step, what we do is that we form a solution. In that case, it's better if you form a saturated solution and dissolve as much solid as you can. Let's read it out so that we can understand these words as well as the parts of the process step by step. First we do is that we take the mixture that we are allowed to separate. Now what we are supposed to do is that the mixture must be containing of at least two materials. What we do is that we first of all ground it to powder. We make sure that we add a suitable liquid solvent. Now how would you know any liquid solvent is suitable? The solvent must dissolve one of the solids you are interested in to separate, but not the others. This is commonly done in lab with a mixture of salt and sand. We're interested in salt, that's an eatable, we're not interested in sand. So what we want to do is that we, from a ground powder of salt and sand, we want to separate salt. So our suitable liquid can easily be water. The good part about water is that the substance we are interested in, which is salt, water can dissolve that. And what we are not interested in, which is sand in this case, water will not be able to dissolve it. Hence, water will be considered as a suitable solvent over here. So remember, the solvent is only suitable if it dissolves the substance you are interested in to separate and not the others. The second step would be uh, to make a solution with that. Before I come with the second step again, you need to form a proper solution with that solvent and dissolve as much amount of solute as you can. Now this usually done with the solvent is being warmed and stirred. With warming and stirring, you can make sure that you can dissolve as much amount of the solute as you can. Now care must be taken at warming stage when using solvents other than water, because there are some solvents which are flammable. However, moving on to the second step, the second step would then be filtration. The warm mixture is then filtered. Now, filtration will give you two things. It would give you a residue, and it would give you a filtrate. If you're interested in this substance, which in this specific part of the book we aren't, but we are gonna consider that later on. So I'm going to teach you right here and now. If you're interested in residue, let's say you're interested in sand, then what you're gonna do is that you're gonna wash it, which is the third step, and you're gonna dry it, which is your fourth step. That's about it. So when you filter, you'll get sand on the top of the filter paper. First, wash those sand, a wash bottle can be used to wash it, and then dry it out. You can dry it, under the fan, under the sun, 
or in an oven. The options are entirely up to you. If you want to wait, you can dry it under the fan or the sun. If you're in a hurry, go ahead and use an oven. Make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's say we are interested in filtrate, which we are, by the way, in this discussion. That is salt. Now you'll get both salt and water in the filtrate. So now we need a process to remove water because water initially wasn't a part of the mixture. We added it on, on our own. So the third part of this process in this case would be evaporation. And we can evaporate water. Remember to evaporate as much water as you can, but not to try evaporating the whole of it. You cannot evaporate all of the water. This in theory might seem possible, but when you're going to go to lab and you'll take a china dish, you'll start heating up the solution in it, which consists of water and a lot of salt. After some time when the water level goes down and water starts boiling, the salt will become jumpy. The salt will literally jump to higher points. And there might even be spitting. And the salt at that point is very hot and this hot spitting can be extremely unsafe. So what we do is that as soon as we start seeing salt crystals and we start seeing water going down and there is more salt than water, stop heating. Don't go for any unsafe action. So what we do is that we evaporate as much water as we, as we can, but not all of it. Then on the fourth step, we go for drying again. What we do is that we wait for it. We let it cool down. The hot water automatically evaporates after some time. Then we get the crystals of salt, which we dry later. Again, you can do that under the fan or under the sun in an oven. The processes depend upon the amount of time you have or the facilities. All right. So at this part of the book, we may not be interested in sand or may not consider the residue, but you need to know the steps to both the sides. If you, we're good, then I can move on. Can I? Yes, mister. Yes, sir. Okay. Next up, fourth and last process among the separated mix, uh, separation of solid mixtures was sublimation. Now, a very, very few solids, if you remember the start of this chapter, a very few solids were there who were able to sublime. Sublimation means that from solid state, when we start heating them up, they bypass the liquid state and are directly converted into gases. For this kind of experiment, we need a couple of tubes in a proper setup. Take a look at this. The outer one is a boiling tube. This has a wider mouth. The inner one is a test tube. This has somewhat a narrower mouth. Cold water goes in, but in an air side system, and cold water comes out of it. Now, what we have at the bottom is the mixture of ammonium chloride and sodium chloride. Let me juggle your memory. Ammonium chloride is one of these substances which can sublime. Sodium chloride cannot sublime, which means when we are going to heat it up, the particles of ammonium chloride would be converted into gas. The particles of sodium chloride may be converted into a liquid or may not be converted at all. Why? Because aluminum, ammonium chloride can sublime at a pretty low temperature while melting point of sodium chloride is pretty high. Now, what happens is that sodium chloride is converted into gas, rises up, but as soon as it confronts a test tube, which has cold water in it, heat exchange takes place, it immediately dissipates its heat and sticks to the tube over here in the form of solid. As sublimation or its reverse consists of a process in which the gas is again directly converted into solid by passing the liquid state. So when we heat it, liquid was converted into gas. When, we, uh, when it interacted with the cold test tube, the gas converted back to the solid. So, Ammonium chloride is the sub subliming substance over here, which sticks to the test tube and is collected over here. 
the crystal condenses on the cool surface. That's how we can separate a sublimable substance from the one which cannot sublime. That's about it for the processes which were able to be separated on the basis of their powdered mixtures. We actually studied four types, density, magnetism difference, the difference in solubility, and finally, the difference in sublimation. Moving on, this is the part of the process of sublimation in which we heat the filtrate up in order to evaporate water or whichever solvent we were using. Next up is distillation. Remember, distillation was carried out when we were interested in separating a solid from a liquid or liquid from a solution in which it was either soluble or miscible respectively. Now distillation has two types. This type of distillation, which we are going to discuss, we're going to call it simple distillation. And the next type on this page would be known as fractional distillation. It would be pretty easy to understand because there would be a fractionating column in fractional distillation and rest of the whole apparatus would be there in simple distillation too. So it's pretty easy to differentiate. Let's start with simple distillation. Let's take seawater in this example. This is distillation flask. We also call it round bottom flask. Both the names are correct and both are credited with marks if you write one in exams. This has been a part of past papers, specifically paper six, right? So round bottom flasks are commonly used for distillation purposes. In this case, we have seawater in it. We have a thermometer. We have this glass side arm connected to a condenser and then to another apparatus. It can be a beaker, it can be a closed material, it can be a similar round bottom flask. It entirely depends upon you. Now, of all this apparatus, what's not given in the book over here, but has been a part of past papers, is the setting. Let's talk about it. First, the first rule of setting is that the bulb of thermometer should be right in front of the condenser. Why is that so? Because this is the temperature point we need to note. We don't need this temperature, we don't need this, we don't need this, we need this one. Why? Because it should be in the face of the condenser here, the vapors, as soon as we heat it, the vapors would rise up. And the point where vapor moves into the condenser will be the point at which it can condense. So the vapors are not being condensed over here, here, or here. They're only being condensed over here. So we need to note the temperature of this point. This point's temperature is crucial because the temperature difference can bring a lot of difference in our experimentation technique. Does it bring a difference in this technique? No, not exactly. Does it bring a difference in fractional distillation technique? Yes, it does. So I'm gonna explain this point a little more in detail when we come to fractional distillation. Let's keep it for now. It might be a little confusing, but let me tell you, I'm going to clarify the confusion once we reach fractional distillation. As far as the setting of condenser is concerned, the condenser is usually filled with water in which the water inlet is always faced downward and the water outlet is always faced upward. Why do we do that? Has been a common question in past papers again. That's how the water doesn't go, fill up the entire thing and leaves out under the action of gravity. In fact, it's the exact opposite. It does it against the action of gravity. You start filling water over here, the water will start filling over here and on this part as well. And eventually when it's completely filled, then the water would move out of the outlet. In that way, the water is going to stay inside the condenser for a longer duration of time, and hence we'll be able to exchange heat to convert these vapors into proper liquid, which can easily trip out to the apparatus we have set up next. Hence, bring us to the point where we can get pure liquid. This is one of the purifying techniques. Why do we call it purifying techniques? 
it's pretty easy to understand because we are able to convert the water into vapors not the salts that are present in seawater so they are simply going to stay over here the water will be converted to vapors the vapors will be condensed in the vapors will be condensed in water vapor in the condenser and will move to the other side that's important that we get the water only and if we get the water only the purification can be as high as 99.8% or less. Are we good? Yes, brother, sir. Okay. So let's move on and let's discuss the differences between this process and fractional distillation given over here. The only difference over here is that we have a fractionating column. This part of the column has been elongated and is now filled with glass beads like this. Why glass? Because glass one is inert and two is transparent, see through. That's why we use glass beads. This was a question in past papers, but they don't ask this question anymore, considering it too easy to answer. Right? So, what we do is that again, we put the thermometer right in front of the condenser's mouth so that we can note the difference. This time, we're not gonna take a solid and liquid solution. We're gonna take two liquids. We're going to consider two liquids which have a very close difference in their boiling points. Ethanol, boiling point of which is around 78 degrees centigrade. Some books also quote 79, that's fine. It's right in between both actually and water, which is 100 degrees centigrade. Now both are liquids and both have a very less difference in their boiling points. When we're gonna heat this one up, actually vapors of both water and ethanol will rise. If we use simple distillation and we don't have these glass beads, both the vapors will move into the condenser, both will get condensed and will again get ethanol and water over here. So simple distillation is a complete failure in this scenario. What do we do? We use a fractionating column. A fractionating column consists of glass beads. The sole purpose of glass beads about, uh, about being inert and transparent is actually to increase the surface area. So these vapors, ethanol and water, need to travel through the whole thing slowly in order to get over here, okay? So they take some time. During that time, you would notice as heat is closer to this area, so the temperature is higher over this, farther from this one, and farthest from this one. So the temperature goes, keeps on decreasing. This one's higher because it's closer to the heated portion. This one's lower because it's farther from the heating portion. What happens is that the temperature decreases. However, as ethanol boils at 78, so ethanol would stay in the form of vapor. All right, even over here, water, however, has a higher boiling point. It is converted into vapor over here, moves to this area, but in fractionating column, it get, get condensed over here. So water drips back and you can see the drops of blue colored water over here. So water is unable to pass over there. This high surface area makes sure that water drips back and does not go to the condenser. So the condenser would only deliver pure yellow colored ethanol in this case. The coloring is just for our understanding. The ethanol is not necessarily yellow, all right? The condenser works in the same way. The purpose of the thermometer is the same. The only difference is that we have brought in a fractionating column with glass beads, which are inert and transparent, also increase the surface area. So the liquid with the higher boiling point would drip right back into the same flask. However, the only liquid with the boiling point would move ahead into the condenser, get condensed, and goes into another beaker or a round bottom flask, whichever piece of apparatus you'd like to use. 
Now, the piece of apparatus over here is also important. If it's on, open mouth and something volatile is going through, that's actually a mistake. But if it's something like water, which is not volatile, which is not going to evaporate quickly, you can even use an open mouth apparatus such as a beaker or a flask. Are we good? Yes, sir. I'm clear. All right. So this was an example of two liquids. Let me tell you, if there are even more liquids, five, six, 10, 20, the list would go in the same way. The one with the least boiling point would distill out first, then the next one, then the next one. And in the very end, the liquid with the highest boiling point would distill out last. And the same thing is actually written on the next page. If you move on to the next page, you'll see that they discuss about ethanol, that it distills first because it has a lower boiling point and is more volatile. Water, which has a higher boiling point and is less volatile, will distill out after. Every liquid that distills out is known as distillate, but in fractional distillation, we call it a fraction. And fractions can be collected separately. If we were separating 10 different liquids, we can get 10 different fractions. The good part about fractional distillation is that it is used to separate any solution containing liquids with different boiling points. A liquid in the mixture with the lowest boiling point or is most volatile but it's still out first. And the final would be the one with the highest boiling point or least volatile. Fractional distillation can be adapted as a continuous process and it is used in industry to separate various fractions for petroleum, which we're gonna discuss in chapter 11 and the different gases from liquid air, which we actually discuss in chapter one of this book. All right. So that's about it for fraction distillation. We're only left with one process. Unfortunately, the heading for which is missing in this book, and that is chromatography. Paper chromatography to be exact, because chromatography is of many types. We only discuss paper chromatography in IGCC papers. And I'm gonna keep that for tomorrow because that's the lengthiest process out of these 10 processes. We're done with nine. Any questions so far? <laughs>